So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first. At last we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. At last we will have revenge. Always do get hard. Good. Twice the pride, double the four. You and the chosen one! That's right, the music is there, which means we are here. Welcome back to Roll On Gaming. My name is Kevin, and joining me, as always, whether you like it or not, is my brother Corwin. How are you today, Corwin? I'm good. I hope, I hope they like it, but yeah, it's uh, it's good to be back on with you. Yeah, it's good to be back. We've uh, we've gone a couple weeks without an episode, but uh, you know, there's been a lot to discuss. Uh, we have some really exciting new information about booster packs. Uh, we're going to get even more information about products this coming week. So with all of that being said, Corwin, where are you at? What's the excitement level? We still at an eight. Have we fluctuated? What's the move? Still holding strong. Um, eight, okay. probably like between eight and 8.5 at this oh, point. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. So we're, we're inching our way up, all but right. uh, definitely cool to see some, um, some rebels characters in the set. Rebels I was characters definitely excited indeed. about that. So, yeah. We'll, we'll get into it, but, some cool cards spoiled this week and obviously a lot to go through with the booster boxes too. Nice. Nice. Yeah. It's still, it's still an eight for you. I think, you know, it's weird. I, I've been at a 10 this whole time. I think I fluctuated this week between like an 11 and like a nine and a half. So I did go down a couple notches for a bit there, but uh, we'll get into all that and some of the things that may have led me astray on the path of righteousness a little bit, but we're going to show you the path that rocks and we're going to start uh, by talking about some of the spoilers that we've missed out on over the course of the last couple weeks. Uh, and then we'll get into some of the booster pack discussions uh, that have been making their way across the airwaves. It's been a crazy time to be uh, tapped into the Star Wars Unlimited fountain. Uh, so let's just dive right in here. So it is command month. We're going to hit command first. Uh, we've got a nice selection here of command cards to start with, uh, including one that sparked a, a decent amount of discussion uh, about whether or not you know it, it was meant to be a, 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 an additional aspect or not. So this is Colonel Yularen. This is a two-cost ground unit. Uh, it's only a command card. There are no other aspects involved in this, which is interesting because he's an Imperial official. And if you read his subtext, he's an ISB director. Some people argue eh, it doesn't sound too neutral, but you never know. Uh, uh, but you're getting a two, three for two cost here. Uh, and the ability is when you play a command unit, including this one, you heal one damage from your base. Corwin, I know you like Colonel Yular a lot, so I'll let you go ahead and start here. Yeah, it's probably my favorite card we've seen spoiled since we were last on, Kevin. Really like this card a lot. Um, it's just coming in really efficient at two resources. The two, three is nice. And then, yeah, it's, you're, you're getting at least one health um, off the base, you know, just with playing him. But then um there there's unlimited potential there as far as how many you know you can get on the board um he might make him a target just because the we've seen that sort of the the heal function is is pretty strong or can be in this game um but i just really like what he brings for two you know he's, he's somebody that you can kind of um get some value with early on if you have uh, some units to play in the beginning of the game or if he's coming out late he's helping you heal up after your base is taking some damage so um really a lot of utility at any point in the in, in the game and and for those two resources i i just think you 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 can't go wrong like the, he's he's bringing you a lot for a very low cost the the thing that i see about him that, that is my favorite thing is not necessarily the the cost efficiency it's not necessarily the ability what i really like about him is the fact that he's an official um i obviously like the fact that he's an imperial because i'm into that sort of thing but the official uh trait right now has a lot of really cool uh low cost um unique effective units that are providing a lot of versatility for your other cards in your deck i mean you look at someone like colonel yularen you look at admiral piet uh, obviously dadana and veers um you know krennic's an official um so when he comes out he's doing some stuff tarkin being an official um, you know, and, and all these, all these cards that I mentioned that are also, uh, cards you can play in a, in a villainy deck, they're all turning on the, uh, the Sentinel ability of the Emperor's Royal Guard, which makes that card so much more exciting to play than say a cell block guard, 
Um, so I think I think official right now is uh, they're showing a lot of versatility within that tra within that trait, and uh, you know I think there's not a there's not necessarily a world that you need to worry about your officials not making a difference because they're definitely going to make a difference. And, and speaking of making a difference, uh, as we're going to breeze through these a little bit here, I want to talk a little about a little bit about Agent Callus. Uh, because Agent Callus may not have sort of that cost efficiency that you're looking for with Colonel Yularen, uh, because he's a five cost ground unit. Again, single aspect, although if you've watched uh, the entirety of Star Wars Rebels, you know why that's true. Uh, I won't give anything else away beyond that. But he's a 4-4 four, four Imperial Trooper with Ambush. Uh, and then he has the other ability when another unique unit is defeated. You may draw a card, use this ability only once each round. Now this is a rare. Uh, and it it has sort of the niche um, usage of a rare, but this one doesn't necessarily fit, like I said, that cost curve that you're seeing with the other unit that we've seen so far, but I think still a really cool unit. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely cool and definitely uh, a good design. I don't like the four health for five costs. That's something I'm definitely going to take issue with, uh, especially given that, that ability. Um, you know, as long as he's out there killing off unique units, he's his power is just going to keep presenting itself, and so he's got a major target on his back right from the get go. Uh, and I think you're going to have to protect him with with sentinels and and other other means of you know keeping the attention away from him. Um, but yeah, I mean, aside from the four health, I like everything else about this card, and I think he is a really well designed unit. So looking forward to seeing kind of how he operates on the field. Um, and I just, I just think if I'm, if I'm looking at command and paying five, I, I'm probably looking at some other options first, but Callus is intriguing for sure, just because of his ability to help you cycle through your deck. So what are you looking at before you look at Callus from a unit perspective in command? Well, I mean, I, I have to, I'd have to dig into that a little bit more, but I mean, for five money, I can have a couple of other units, um, like, like a two cost and a three cost potentially, um, you know, and, and, and get a little bit more, more health that way. Um, and obviously, you know, we haven't seen all of the command cards yet in the set, Sure. but, but I think that, um, I'm just going to be interested in seeing you know how much tankier I can get for five, uh, as opposed to to putting one relatively fragile unit on the board. He's definitely fragile. You know him being squishy. I think is sort of the balance point with the additional card draw and the ambush and all that. And you know I think if he had an additional aspect attached to him, um, you'd probably see it, that health rise up a little bit, even to a four or five. Um, you know because you want him to stick around to 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 get the the most out of out of the draw ability. I think if you look at this as a five for a four four plus two cards, you're feeling pretty good about it. If you look at it as a five four four plus one, you feel somewhat okay with it. And if you're just looking at it as a five four four with ambush, it's not great. You want to make sure you're ensuring that card draw to be able to justify the cost here. But over, but again, another imperial, also a trooper. Um, so I think there's going to be some synergy there. Um, you know, you, he obviously becomes a five five with veers. Um, whether, you know, if you have them on the board, obviously. So we'll see what people can do with Callus. But the point is valid that the four health isn't great for the cost, but I do think he's going to do some things. And as as we've seen in card games, card draw is great. Yeah, I think if you draw two with him, you're in really good shape. Yeah. And he's definitely returning value. But to me, like, that's that's where you have to get to. And so the question will be, can he last two rounds? Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe he can. if And... Because timing matters too, right? Sequencing with him is going to be pretty critical. Yeah, I'll say this. Agent Callus loves seeing R2-D2 and C-3PO on the other side of the board. <laughs> uh, so that's that's neither here nor there. Uh, we'll move on to uh, another command card here, the Hard Point Heavy Blaster. Uh, this was uh, part of the uh, reveal one card a, a week fan that uh, FFG has been doing. Um, I also want to point out that, uh, that Colonel Yularen was uh, revealed by the What a Piece of Junk podcast. Uh, so that link will be in the description below. And then Callus was revealed by Holocron Gaming. I want to make sure I get both of those in um, because they both did good jobs re releasing their cards. Uh, so you'll be able to find both of those links in the description box. Um, this one was released by FFG. Uh, so we won't include that because FFG is the overlord. Um, but uh, we like it anyway. Uh, this is a this is a command upgrade. 
Hardpoint Heavy Blaster, you can attach it to a vehicle unit to give it plus two, plus two. An attached vehicle unit also gains an on attack ability. Uh, if this unit isn't attacking a base, you may deal two damage to a unit in the defender's arena. So you can do that, uh, obviously, before damage is dealt. Uh, so it's a way to either uh, add two to your, to your damage against another unit or deal your damage uh, and then add two more to another unit, spreading the damage around. I think this has some potential that vehicles see a renaissance in Star Wars Unlimited. This is a, a really flexible card and, and definitely one I like a lot. Um, it's, it's again, two costs, you know, how I'm going to, I'm going to push that, that agenda forward, Kevin, but, mm -hmm. um, it's, you can play it in either arena, which is great. Um, uh, we've already seen a lot of, of really good, um, vehicle space units that, um, you know, villainy in particular is bringing. And so this, this really, um, kind of strikes a chord with me there, especially with some of those cards being able to also deal damage upon play. Uh, just a lot of surprise damage coming out with that effect. Um, and this just compounds on that. Plus, it's giving you uh, plus two, plus two. So I, I just think really, really solid upgrade here. And I definitely am going to want this in my command decks if I'm going a little bit more vehicle heavy with my unit builds. I think for me, like this card works best on a low cost unit. I think if you're putting this on an ATST or an ADAT, -AT, it's. It's good, but I don't think you necessarily need the help at that point. Um, I think if you're putting this on an X-Wing um, and you're making that a, uh, a four or five that also spreads too, uh, that becomes a lot more difficult to deal with, especially in the early game. Um, and you're going to get a lot of value out of that X-Wing um, for people to have to try to trade into or get rid of. I mean, it doesn't die to open fire at that point. Um, you know, it's it's it's... Definitely makes itself a vanquished target, but you know your opponent has to get to five resources to 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 get there, which is two turns later than you can potentially play this on an X wing. So I think it's going to see some uh, some play, um, like you said in in vehicle command decks. Um, whether or not it it proves to you know be worthy of an include in a fifty card deck remains to be seen. But yeah, you're definitely getting some value out of this if you play it uh, pretty early. Uh, and speaking of value, this is instant value. And I uh, am a big fan of some of the implications of this card. Uh, this is the Death Trooper. Now, we knew this was coming. We knew this was coming ever since we saw the art. But it was officially revealed by the Garbage Rollers podcast. Um, again, link below. Um, go check them out. Check out their reveal. Um, super excited to see the Death Trooper because of the synergies involved here. This is a three-cost ground unit. Uh, double aspect. It's Vigilance and Villainy. Uh, for that three, you're getting a 3-3 three, three Imperial Trooper. Uh, and when this card is played, you deal two damage to a friendly ground unit and two damage to an enemy ground unit. Now, if you play this and there's nothing else in the ground unit, you have to deal the damage to Death Trooper. But, again, with some synergy with Krennic, if you deal that damage to himself, now he's a 4-1 instead of a 3-1. Um, so he's he's adding that value. Again, you, you, know, you increase that with Veer's to a to a five two uh you know this this card i think being able to delete something early with that two damage like a leia uh, or finishing something off if you know they've got if you're able to do two damage to r2 or 3po and this can just take it out and then also increase its attack um, i think this has some potential you know four one is not great especially against if you're playing vader but three one is worse but I think this slots immediately into a Krennic deck and we'll be happy to do so. Yeah, do we do we think, I don't know, Kevin, what are your thoughts on Krennic thus far? What kind of tools does he have to kind of make this kind of strategy viable? Because, yeah, I mean, obviously he's going to boost the Death Trooper's value, but if not running him in a Krennic deck, like, I just, I I can't get as excited about him. So what what do you kind of see, what are you kind of seeing there with, with Krennic? Well, I think, I think again, I think Krennic's the obvious pairing. I don't necessarily know that you put this in anything else, but there also is nothing else blue to put it in right now uh, in Villain. True, um, true. So, you know, unless you're running the the Vigilance base, and I don't think there's a lot of, enough vi Villain Vigilance support right now to do that. Um, I think Krennic's in a good spot when you pair him with something like Command. Uh, that can that can ramp and also has the multiple officials to pair with him uh, that have maybe some 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 additional health 
uh, like a Piet who can become a 2-4 instead of a 1-4, um, you know, a Tarkin who can become uh, who, whatever he is. <laughs> but um, I, I do think Krennic's got some juice. I think he'll get more juice as we go. Um, but uh, I, this Death Trooper is, is I think, an, an automatic include in a Krennic, you know, and you pair that with something like Rugged Survivors um, and then the Green Sweep. Um, you know, making turning your uh, turning your um, uh, Emperor's Royal Guard into a four attack instead of a three attack because it's got that Sentinel there with all the officials you're running. Again, there's some spice to it, but I think this Death Trooper is tailor made for Krennic, and as of now, probably nothing else. Okay, yeah, that's fair. I mean, I kind of see it the same way. I just don't know that I love the two damage coming back to me upon playing this card if I'm not getting extra value out of that. I mean, there's some some gimmicky plays I can think of with like, you know, Super Laser or, or Mahdi or something. But like, again, that's going to mean you're in green. So it just feels very niche. Um, and maybe in the right deck, he'll do some work. But um, generally speaking, I think I'm a little lower than than some of the others. I'll say this. If there, if, if there becomes a deck down in the future... With a lot of cards that have grit, this is going to be fantastic, fantastic. Mm. So we'll we'll see if that comes to pass. But right now, I think it's just uh, it's just uh, pretty cool. Yeah, context dependent for sure. Indeed. Uh, so then we get to then we get to what you mentioned and you alluded to in the beginning, Corwin, with uh, Star Wars Rebels characters, um, starting with a uh, with a Sabine leader, which was sort of a surprise to most, but a, a but a welcome one. Um, Sabine was our <laughs> first. Uh, red heroism card, which uh, made some folks very excited. Um, so this Sabine uh, is aggro personified, right? This is a this is a ag aggression heroism leader that has an action where all you have to do is exhaust Sabine, and you'll deal one damage to each base. Just just pack up and go, deal that damage. And then this one actually deploys at four resources, which is the first mm -hmm. leader that we've seen to do that. And when you when you deploy Sabine, you're getting a two five. Uh, it's for a Mandalorian Rebel and Specter, uh, and on attack you deal one damage to each enemy base. Little multiplayer thrown in there, but also um, now you're not doing the damage to yourself; you're just doing it to your opponent's base. Uh, this, I mean, if you're playing Sabine, you better be prepared to go fast because that's yeah, what this is trying just... to do. Yep, agreed. It just feels like it's going to be a race, a very, very fast race with her. And uh, yeah, I mean, we don't have a lot of support yet for hero or um, yeah, heroism aggression. So I'm curious to see what the context will be for Sabine. It's really hard to evaluate her right now with just having basically her card and that's it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can kind of tell the direction they're going with it fast, 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 got it. You know, if you're dealing one to each every turn, that means you're going to be just kind of aggressively pumping the base, um, you know, relentlessly with your strategy. And, and I'll be curious to see what that looks like from a design standpoint. I, I don't think this is one, unless you're running a ton of restore. I don't think this is a leader where you run one of the 25 health bases. I think this has to be a 30 health and go. Um, All right. So, you know, I guess we'll see. But you were saying that that red heroism doesn't have a ton of help. What if I saw your Sabine and then I raised it with Sabine? Uh, <laughs> so Unit Sabine. We, we did also get Unit Sabine. Now, this one came from TCG Player Infinite, um, which uh, posted an, uh, a second article this week after their first, which we'll get into a bit later. But uh, the Sabine unit is a two cost ground unit. Again, a double aspect in aggression and heroism. For that two cost, you're getting a two, three, same traits, Mandalorian, Rebel, and Spectre. Uh, and a little bit interesting on this one. Uh, while there are at least three aspects among other friendly units, this unit can't be attacked unless she gains Sentinel. And on attack, you may deal one damage to the defender or to a base. So encouraging, you know, not playing what is considered mono, um, which is only, you know, two aspects instead of three. Um, encouraging having uh, aspect diversity on the board to put this down and then just snipe away from the sidelines, um, you know, and, and being a little bit more discriminate than the leader about where you're putting that extra damage. You know, this essentially becomes a 3-3 three, three if you're hitting base, uh, a 3-3 three, three if you're hitting unit, or a 2-3 
with one to the base. So a lot of flexibility here. And there's definitely a world in which not being able to attack with this, not being able to attack this Sabine can open up some spicy plays where if you're boosting Sabine in any way, your opponent's going to have to work pretty hard to get rid of it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, love the art on this card too, by the way. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a little tough with Sabine because you you definitely want to take advantage of her ability there with the with the um, not being able to be attacked. So it, she doesn't feel like a great early game card. Hmm. But later on, um, once you've got some units on the board, you know, deploying her and and giving her that immunity could potentially be big, especially if you're then able to like you know, pump her up with upgrades or some, some other way to, to raise her attack. Um, so definitely feel like there will be applications for her at some point, but probably a card that you're again, going to have to, to sequence, right. And make sure that you're, you're trying to, to really take advantage of that. Um, uh, keeping her, you know, off, off of, uh, of the opponent's radar. Cause you know, that one attack that she does that one damage, it's going to add up. And the longer you can keep her protected and, and let her keep on pinging, uh, the better off, obviously, you'll be. So um, we'll see how this how this shakes out. But I, I'm I'm uh, holding some reservations on Sabine for now until we see more of what what tools she has to work with. There's definitely a lot that we're going to learn about uh, aggression heroism in the next month or so. Um, yeah. Considering uh, November, October, October is aggression month so we'll see what we get there uh so let's get to two more of these and then we'll talk about packs uh it's all specters from here on out right so we just saw sabine let's talk about kanan which was revealed on an albeit short fantasy flight stream uh, on wednesday uh this kanan is a four cost ground unit vigilance heroism so now you're seeing the diversity of aspects within the diversity of specters uh you're getting a four five force jedi rebel specter it's a lot of traits. That's the same amount of traits as we saw in Palpatine. Um, and it was sort of revealed uh, by Tyler, one of the designers, that Force is, is what they consider to be the strongest as, uh, trait in the game. So who knows what that means? Uh, we don't. We obviously <laughs> don't see it, it yet, but we'll find out. Uh, and Kanan has an interesting ability. Uh, so on attack, you may discard one card from the defending player's deck for each friendly Spectre unit. Heal one damage from your base for each different aspect among the discarded cards. So a little bit of a mill, but mostly a heal of the base. Um, for that four, you're getting a four five, which is better than Callus for one less. Uh, you know, we'll point that out. Um, what do you think of this Kanan here? I really like this card. Um, I think he's he's got a really good body for four. Um, the the attack and restore function definitely going to be interesting. Uh, you know, he's a specter himself, so you'll at least get to discard one every time. And that one could potentially have two aspect icons. We've seen a lot of cards like that. So, um, if you're restoring for two off of an attack like that, um, really, really nice value there. So I, I think, yeah, Canyon looks really good to me and I'm excited to, to put him in my vigilance decks for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be playing a ton of heroism, uh, at least not on the surface, but <laughs> you know, the art on this card is great. The ability, I think, can be super useful if you're able to get a ton of Spectres on the board, which I anticipate a lot of people are going to be trying to do because the Spectre archetype was popular in Star Wars Destiny. The trait seems to be pretty popular here. Uh, I, I I, think people are going to want this card. Now, If it, again, we're seeing a diversity of aspects here. What's going to be interesting is, does Vigilance make the cut? Is there something that allows it to make the cut when you're playing all these Spectres? You know, because, again, you've got... You've got Sabine, who is red. You've got Kanan, who is blue. We haven't seen a Hera. We haven't seen a Zeb. One would assume that potentially Hera would be Command. Who knows about Zeb? Could go uh, uh, any different way on that one. But we've also seen, and this was the last spoiler of the week, uh, courtesy of Fantasy Flight Games via Ryback Stun. Uh, so again, link below. Go check out the reveal video for that. Uh, we did see Ezra Bridger here. Uh, which was a very timely uh, reveal as well. Uh, so this is a three-cost ground unit in the cunning aspect, so cunning heroism. For three, you're getting a 3-4 four Force Rebel Spectre. Uh, and when this unit completes an attack, look at the top card of your deck. You may play it, discard it, or leave it on the top of your deck. I think this is the best Spectre we've seen to this point. What do you think? 
Mm, interesting. Yeah, um, I I think I give Kanan an edge over Ezra, but I I do think that Ezra's he looks he looks pretty good. Um, I think being able to essentially do a little bit of R two action and um, you know peeking at what's coming in your deck that's all, information is always useful. So a good ability there. Also the ability to potentially play that card is nice, especially you know because it gives him some extra utility late. Uh, so I do like that quite a bit. Uh, three four is solid. So yeah, he just he just looks like an overall solid card. I do think I'm I'm a little bit more excited about Kanan though. Just uh, just really like that uh, that on attack ability. And uh, from what I've seen from from Restore so far, I think it's it could potentially do some some good work and um, you know might might have a little bit more to it than this, but. Again, Ezra coming in at three costs, that's going to be nice. He hits the board a little sooner and um, can help you kind of game plan a little bit as as you uh, plan for the upcoming turns. Yeah, I think that that flexibility with his lower cost and the ability to do what, almost whatever you want with the card that you that you see, um, mm -hmm. I think for me gives that the edge over Kanan. Now, important note here, Ezra does have to survive the attack for you to be able to get this. So it's not it's not an on-attack ability like R2 and 3PO. Which sort of sets that apart a little bit and helps to balance this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this is only an uncommon here, um, but again, three for the three four body with a really cool um, ability. Um, I think this Ezra is going to see a lot of play in not just Spectre decks, whereas I think you know, obviously with the with the uh, the abilities as they are worded, Sabine and and Kanan are going to have to be a little bit more restricted to some wide Spectre decks uh, potentially. But this this Ezra I think is going to be good no matter where you see it um it's it's to the point where you almost wonder if you want to pay five for it i don't think you do um but again if you have a lot of cards in your deck that give units pluses or give units ambush or you know deletion if you're playing this with aggression you know imagine playing this uh or attacking with this completing the attack and then flipping an open fire and then removing a second unit you know so like there's yeah. There's stuff to be done here, um, and I think that you're gonna want you're gonna want to see this Ezra hit the hit the table early and often. Um, so I that, like it. So that's it for spoilers. Um, you know, a thanks to all the creators who were able to reveal those. Uh, you know, obviously getting slowly but surely getting the bigger picture. I saw on the discords that we're almost at a hundred cards, which is crazy um, because <laughs> who knows how far away we are from this game. Uh, but let's talk about sort of the main discussion point of the week which was booster packs. Uh, we finally got to see a glimpse of what we would could expect when opening a booster box of Star Wars Unlimited. Uh, there's a lot to quote unquote unpack here. Uh, so we'll go ahead and just dive right in. Uh, the, the gist of it, which you probably already know by now, is you're getting 16 cards in a pack and you're getting 24 packs in a box. So you're getting 384 cards when you buy a booster box of Star Wars Unlimited. They're probably gonna talk about prices in the upcoming uh, stream this this coming Wednesday, uh, so we'll get a sense of that uh, if you're watching this this video before that stream. Um, of those 384 cards, 24 of them are guaranteed to be rares or legendaries because there's one rare or legendary in every pack. Um, there's a chance for more, but we'll get into all that. Um, every pack has a leader and a token base. Um, so leader, you can either get a common leader or they did say that there were rare leaders coming, which to me was one of the most exciting things they said is that, you know, you're going to, you're going to see a higher rarity of leader. That's going to have potentially an even cooler or more niche or more exciting ability to build around. Are you excited about rare leaders the same way I am? Or do you think they should have all been common to just give everybody the same amount of access to them? No, no, I, th I think rare leaders is awesome. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about the, uh, the, the, the extra special variant on top of that too. But, uh, but yes, rare leaders all for it. Let's do it. Yeah. Uh, the base that's going to be in the base slot is always, uh, one of the common 30 HP bases. Um, if you do get a rare base, it's going to take up your rare slot. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's something there. Uh, there are nine commons in a pack, three uncommons in a pack. And then I mentioned the rare legendary. You're also getting one foil every pack. So that's the distribution. They were very intentional about discussing how this pack breakdown 
was designed for sealed and draft, was designed for limited formats. 16 cards is a ton. Um, if you're buying six packs for sealed, uh, you're going to have a lot of cards in which to build your deck. Um, you know, draft yeah. the draft rules remain to be seen. But when you look at this, does it make you that much more excited for limited events when you see this breakdown? Yes. That, I mean, going through this stream and, and listening to everything that was discussed, that was the thing I was thinking about the entire time. Is like the limited play is going to benefit tremendously from this structure. And I'm really excited about that for one, because, you know, we've talked about it on the show before, Kevin, like I want to, when Unlimited comes out, I want to get back in the stores and I want to play with, with my community and I want to support my local game store. And so limited events are one of the best ways to do that. And I foresee myself participating in quite a few of those. So to think that this structure is going to further promote that, love that there's 16 cards in a pack, love that you've got these different chances for different rarities and, and um and other types of cards it just feels like they really did put sealed and draft at the forefront when they were designing these um and i think that feels great it, it really feels great and it helps promote casual play it helps promote collection building it helps promote um, communities coming together for you know fun opportunities to to open and exchange and trade i mean it's just this is this is um really, really, really strong uh, f uh, front foot here that they're putting forward with um, with limited play in mind. I, I said at the beginning that there, I was fluctuating between an 11 and a nine and a half in terms of excitement level. This is what brought me up to 11 because I've, sure. I've always yeah. known, right, that, that when the game came out, just like you, I was going to want to be playing events every week if I could manage it with my schedule. I mean, you know, schedule's a little tough, but whatever. Nobody cares. What, what, do, what people do care about are these packs. And and I think overall it's been well sort of uh, emoted that these are going to be great for sealed. Uh, it's going to be something that, you know, it's going to make me want to uh, go and do sealed every week, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I'd be totally fine with doing sealed once a week buying the six packs, making something new, seeing what we get. Like, that would be super cool. I can't really speak on draft yet because draft is, we don't know the draft rules. And like, I don't like draft as much as I like sealed. I'm greedy. I like keeping the cards that I that I buy without giving them away. You know what I mean? I'm weird like that. Mm. But there's there's a world in which I'm going to like draft just as much as I like sealed, which would be super cool. Um, so we'll see where we get there. But yeah, I think that uh, that draft is, is or that sealed is going to be really fun with these. No question. No question at all. And do, we don't know for sure it's six packs, though, do we? Uh, I think they mentioned on a stream that uh, the pre-releases were going to be in the sealed format, which was six packs. Uh, somebody feel free to correct oh, okay. me on that in the comments below. Uh, there's definitely I probably world, missed it. There's definitely a world in which that's not the case, but we'll see where we get uh, as we get closer and we start fleshing out a little bit more of the, of the limited rules. Um, yeah, I mean... 96 cards to build a deck with that's that's a lot of options yeah so that feels like a pretty generous um you know card pool for a sealed event but i guess if you're building a 50 card deck maybe not but i would imagine sealed play would maybe be less than 50 i don't know I don't, we'll see but uh but yeah it definitely feels like um a, a healthy number of, of packs to have for for sealed absolutely uh so you mentioned the chance to get more and let's so let's dive into that a little bit because they also revealed some of the additional treatments that you could see for cards in these packs, and the big sort of meat of that uh, are the hyperspace cards. Um, so hyperspace cards are going to be full art, full frame uh, treatments of every card in the set. Everyone, commons, uncommons, rares, legendaries, leaders, bases. Hyperspace is, is a, a version of that where you're not going to have the full black frame around the card. It's going to be all the way to the edges with the exception of the text boxes sort of getting in the way. Um, there's a little bit of a hyperspace flare on the sides. Um, now, those cards you can get almost anywhere in your pack. If you get one in one of the nine common slots, it's going to be a common, but you're getting a hyperspace common. 
Uh, if you get one in one of the uncommon slots, it could be an uncommon. It could also be a rare or a legendary hyperspace card in that uncommon slot. So that does two things. One, it guarantees that your rare and legendary is always going to be non-hyperspace, non-foil. Uh, that's just going to be your basic rare legendary there. But it does give you that added chance for a hyperspace rare or legendary in that uncommon slot. So your pack can potentially can contain more rares or more legendaries than it would normally. Um, and then they also have foil hyperspace treatments, which is a, even a higher odds, but is bonkers to think about that you could also potentially have a foil hyperspace in your foil slot. And that could also be a rare or legendary. So when you combine all of these things, there's a chance at a rare or legendary in the foil slot. There's a guaranteed rare or legendary in that slot. There's a chance at a rare legendary in the uncommon slot via a hyperspace card. And then if that wasn't enough, there's a chance at a rare leader when you first open the pack. So four rares and or legendaries in one pack is possible. And if that wasn't enough, then we get to the showcase cards, which everybody lost their minds when they saw showcase cards for a bunch of different reasons. Showcase cards are, as of now, the only art alternate art treatments that we've seen in the game. Um, they are completely new artwork, uh, restricted to all of the leaders. So no, you're not going to see any showcase units or upgrades or events at this time. Um, and they are hard to find. They are one in approximately every 12 boxes. So... Whoa, lots to take in there. Uh, I know I sort of just sped through it, but there's a lot of things for people to potentially open in these packs. As a whole, I think that's a good thing. It, well, of course, yeah, absolutely. Uh, very much a good thing. I know that, you know, like we said before, some people are going to be in this for the collectability aspect, and this is very much catered to, to them, but it's also catered to many of the rest of us who just are going to actually play the game i know for sure i'm going to want to collect some of these cards mm -hmm. i i love foil cards i i love the showcase idea i mean that that is i i understand that they're super rare to pull but i think that's good i i think that there should be those cards that are that are hard to obtain and um and that you can kind of ch try to chase down because that that generates a lot of fulfillment for some folks who, again, really lean into the collectability aspect. So I think having that in existence is good. It's It might be a bit frustrating for folks who are trying to like really get their hands on one of those very specific leaders. Um, but I, I just think overall, uh, having the additional sort of um, you know, potential for uh, a lot more fun cards and a lot more uh, rare cards in your packs is just going to keep the excitement always there um, every time you rip. So uh, really happy to see this layout. I, I, I'm excited about it, but I'm guessing, Kevin, maybe a little bit of uh, reluctance on your part. There's a little bit of wistful disappointment and also excitement at the same time, which is, again, this is the other side of the fluctuation because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say something that's potentially a hot take here. And I understand that I might be in, in the vast, vast minority with this. To me, just to me, I, I'm not, I'm never going to tell people how to collect. I'm never going to tell people what to, uh, what to do with their money or their time or their hobby or anything like that. But to me, showcases are not a chase. Showcases are a lottery ticket. Okay. Because one in 12 boxes is more volume than 99% of, of what I believe the player base will be invested in. 99%. So if you're going to attempt to chase showcases, you're in for a significant financial investment. Uh, and that's fine. Again, collect how you want to collect. But I just don't see a world in which I or a lot of people are opening anywhere close to 12 boxes in their... Um, in their uh, uh, collecting journey. Now, if I'm playing sealed every week, uh, 
there's there's a world in which we get to 12 boxes you know decently regularly uh once every you know few weeks or whatever uh and then again it becomes the lottery ticket are you in the right place at the right time where you're the one who happens to just snag that ultra rare showcase that that nobody else in your play group is ever going to see and if that's the case awesome great for you i mean i'm certainly going to want these cards i'm certainly going to be prowling the secondary market to see when their price comes down but i had to sort of turn my brain off from the sense that like okay this is the only alternate art treatment in the game and in all likelihood i'm not going to be able to collect it because trying to trying to buy 36 boxes to to snag a, a handful of showcases is not realistic for me um so that's the one side of it and you know i i love i love the showcases I just, I have to train myself to understand that they're probably not going to make their way to me unless I go and buy them in the secondary market. So that was sort of... Yeah, I mean, if if you're a completionist, then then yes, it, it's going to be a bit of a feel bad to, to know that there are cards out there that are lurking, which will be very difficult to obtain. So I definitely understand that part of it. But I think the point you make about um, generally accumulating your way up to where you're giving yourself a chance at these is is the the point I would make um, in response, which is that as you just kind of go along and um, acquire cards for the game, and if we if we are both going to go and play a bunch of limited events as we've been talking about, then yeah, eventually our pack count is going to get up there mm -hmm. to where we're going to you know the odds will be in our favor, and um, you know that one that one score that you might hit is something that you could then turn into maybe a different showcase that you want, or maybe some other cards that you're really looking for. And so um, I, I, I still, I, I definitely hear what you're saying. And I do think that, you know, the one in 12 boxes for someone who's just going to try to collect by buying boxes straight off the rip, it's, it, yeah, it's going to be a hefty hill to climb. But I, um, I just think that over time, eventually, you're going you're gonna to find one. Uh, this is just mathematically speaking, you know, you'd have to have some pretty bad luck <laughs> to go on a streak of like 40 boxes with no showcases. But, um, you know, patience will obviously be a big part of, of it. And uh, and I think, you know, for me, that's I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm perfectly fine with with having cards out there in the ether that theoretically could find their way into my collection, but um, that won't do so. So without some some serious luck and I, I think that's okay but i i would counter with saying that like you and i are in a position where you know whether it comes true or not we can discuss doing things like a buying multiple boxes and b drafting every week you know whether or not we decide to do that that remains to be seen again we're going to get pricing info hopefully next week or this coming week rather but i think for the casual collector again that sort of might turn them off from trying to you know get their hopes up to cutting down a showcase or to to acquiring a showcase because again you know even if this were one in eight boxes it would still be a little bit more attainable like i don't know how many boxes are in a case it may not be 12 it may be four like lorcana it may be six eight ten um but you know if this is if this is one a case you know you, again right place right time now I hear you in the sense that volume is going to be important. Um, and again, these are really, really cool. Like, I don't even like Leia in terms of, like, my my tier list of characters uh, or my tier list of leaders in the game. And I and I want this Leia. And I can only imagine what, you know, like a Krennic would look like. Oh, my goodness, a Krennic. I can't even, I can't even, <laughs> I just, I got a little too excited there. Wow. Um, didn't even think about that till just now. But... <laughs> if we spin it back to the positive here, because I do think there are a lot of positives and a lot of things to be excited about with this pack distribution. I think the chases for me are the hyperspace cards and specifically the hyperspace leaders, right? Because you can get a hyperspace leader, not a, not a showcase leader, just a hyperspace one. You can either get it in regular or foil. And I think being able to drop your full art leader, just like we saw with, 
the Gen Con promos of Luke and Vader, which were hyperspace and nobody knew it yet. Being able to have that out in the field the entire game is going to look really awesome. You know, it's not it's not like, oh, well, I didn't draw my hyperspace cards. You know, do I want to have as many hyperspace cards as possible in my deck? Absolutely. Right. But just having that constant out there, whether it's deployed or not, and especially if it's foil, uh, that sounds pretty sweet. You know, and so I think that for me is going to be something I get excited about seeing in a pack and chasing in a pack is, hey, I got a hyperspace leader. I'm going to be even more eager to play with this leader now because it's in it's in super cool format and it may not be a showcase, but it still is a it still is a piece to be admired in my collection. Yeah, I can get on board with that. I mean, hyperspace cards in general, I think uh, automatically once once you have them, <laughs> they will become a lot more attractive as options to include. Um, just to, you know, just to, to put some, some really cool looking cards on the field. So totally with you on that. I think I think the hyperspace leaders and for me, um, for me, the foil hyperspace in particular, um, especially the rare and legendary kinds, yeah. you know, we've got the one in 50 packs there. So that's, you know, again, those are going to be pretty tough too. You know, yeah. it's going to take a couple of boxes to get them, but like those cards are going to look really sweet. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm excited for those. Yeah. And that, and that I think is, is sort of where I hoped and it's sort of unrealistic to think this, but it's sort of the range and where I hope the showcase would be right. Because you could realistically with perfect distribution, go two whole boxes without hitting a foil hyperspace rare or legendary like that is sort of an, a, a little bit more of an attainable chase goal um it's still gonna be really hard to find but like if they had been like a little closer to that so, you know someone meet me in the middle between 50 packs and 12 boxes i think i would have felt a little bit better about it you know i think some of these odds are really really favorable like the hyperspace cards being two in every three packs approximately is incredible um, because again you never know you have that chance of it's not always going to be a common hyperspace card it, it could potentially be another uncommon a rare a legendary a cool base a cool leader you know so that's really sick um you hyperspace rares and legendaries that are non-foils about one in every 15 packs so you could potentially hit one a box if you're lucky you could hit two a box you know that sort of thing is is again somewhat attainable um and yeah, I think the hyperspace cards are, are a, a big win. I don't want that to get lost in all this because I think, again, hyperspace cards are the star of this announcement. They're the chase of the product. Um, but yeah, ma <laughs> master set collectors are going to have a really tough time with this one because every card's going to come in normal. Every card's going to come in foil. Every card's going to come in hyperspace. And conceivably, every card's going to come in hyperspace foil if I'm reading the articles and, inf and digesting the information correctly. And then the showcase is on top of that. So good luck. Uh, you know you're gonna be you're gonna be prowling the uh, the secondary markets trying to get the best deals possible because uh, it's a lot of cards. And this is just the first set. You're gonna have to do this for every single one. <laughs> That's uh, woo. Yeah. Good luck. Good luck indeed. Yeah. Um, not a road I'll be traveling down, but uh, but certainly uh, again, I think there's there's you said it like ultimately. I think the positives outweigh the negatives here, and and um, you know if if you even want to say there are negatives. No, and that's and that's that's where I want to go with this is I don't think they're negatives because they're not. Yeah. Because there's no yeah. way you can take a look at that Leia card and say that's a negative. No chance, right? It's just or anything like her. No, like it's just right to, to think that there's potentially others floating out. I, yeah, I just think um, I, I, it's it's all a win to me, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know I I feel like you're saying the same just. Would like to have seen the the showcases be a little more accessible. It's just training my brain to realize that I can't always get what I want, you know. And <laughs> there you go. And that's just sort of what it is. But uh, either way, I am massively hyped to open packs of Star Wars Unlimited. I can't wait for mm -hmm. it to get here. I don't know if FFG is trolling us by changing some of the wording a little bit on the on the pack article to say first half of twenty twenty four. Now, is that better than second half? Yeah. But that also opens up a window from January to June. And if I have to wait till June to open packs, I'm going to be a very antsy boy. Uh, so I, 
I, I'm hoping it's a little early. Maybe like soon they change it to first quarter or whatever. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I, I just, man, the with the with this announcement and the product line announcement coming later this week, I think the future is really, really bright for this game. You know, we got to finish out command month. We're starting to get some some new spicy cards in the mix along with the command cards. We got aggression next month and then pr uh, presumably cunning in November. There's still so much to learn about this game. You know, once we hit 100 cards, we'll still have 152 more to go. Not to mention more showcases if those ever get revealed before the set comes out. So, yeah, I'm just, I'm ready, man. I'm ready. Like, bring me <laughs> all the news. Bring me all the smoke. I want it. And you'll get it. <laughs> you'll get it for sure. <laughs> yeah, I certainly hope um, so. Yeah. No, th this was an exciting stream. And I think it is building hype. It is, you know. We're, who doesn't love opening packs, right, Kevin? I mean, come on, this is this is fantastic. Like, there's just so many goodies you can you can get, and um, I, yeah, I'll, I'll be very excited to to start ripping uh, as soon as I can. And yeah, the weight is is definitely um, it's definitely something that's not it's starting to sit less and less well with me yeah, too. Like, yeah. it's, you know. Yeah, like we're getting excited here. Like, let's go. Come on. <laughs> but no, I, and it also should be said before we before we sign off here, it should be said that like, who doesn't love opening packs? Like, who doesn't love opening packs where you can actually get cool stuff like this? Like, yeah. you know, I think that was another one of the issues with Destiny is that after you got a full playset, opening packs became sort of stale and there was really no point to it. Um, yeah. You know, if you just needed one legendary, it was way cheaper to just go out and buy that legendary go out and buy talisman of resurrection you know rather than opening 30 packs trying to find that one potential legendary out of the 17 that they printed in that set you know whatever so this is going to be a real way for people to continue to stay excited about purchasing product which is good for the company and about playing the limited format which is good for the game and the community so when both of those things collide you're going to be in a really good spot I think the final sort of test, and this has been mentioned by other by other podcasts, so I don't want to sound like I'm plagiarizing, but I think it's true. The final sort of boss in all of this is, can we get enough product on release to be able to just go out and draft whenever we want and go out and play sealed whenever we want when the game comes out? If that is if that is the case, if they have built this this set and this game around limited format, then they need to be able to have the product to be able to provide the limited format to players. Because good luck trying to play limited or any kind of Lorcana right now. You know what yep. I mean? So yep. and and it's and it's not just Lorcana, like One Piece had this had this problem too. Um, you know, when it first came out and now it seems like they've sort of settled that a little bit. So I just I want to be able to do all these things we're talking about and hold these community events and play the game with all these other people who are excited to play about to play it with and just continue to foster that community that is excited about opening new things and getting cool cards and then being able to play with those cool cards. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't have said it better myself. I think all of those points are, are, are spot on. And um, obviously we all hope that the support at the distribution level is going to be there for for us to be able to to get our hands on product from the get go and to continuously have our hands on product as we as we want to build our collections out. So yeah, um definitely going to you know keep keep uh, positive vibes going there and um not let any of that stuff sort of hamper the excitement and the and the hype for what we've seen. But yes, I think all of that is is um is going to eventually come to a head and and we'll just be ready for whatever's thrown at us but I, for you know at, at some point we're going to get our hands on packs at some point we're going to get our our chances at these cards and that's what i'm excited for i mean i'm ready i'm ready for all of it so we'll go ahead and wrap up there um thank you all for those of you who made it this far thank you so much for listening for listening it'll be ramble um again we're both very excited so there's a lot of rambling going on but uh we really appreciate the support uh, the continued support on our channel. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please go ahead and subscribe. Uh, we're going to be continuing to churn out Star Wars Unlimited content up to and through release. We've got some exciting plans in the works that I hope we can pull off, fingers crossed. 
Um, so go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Feel free to leave a like on the video if you enjoyed the content and comment down below your thoughts on pack distribution, on the chases, on showcases. If I'm crazy, go ahead and tell me anything you want to talk about. Uh, we'd love to hear from you down in the comments below. So feel free to go ahead and share your thoughts there. But that's it for us for this episode. Uh, thank you to my co-host Corwin, as always, for putting up with me. Uh, for my brother Corwin, I am Kevin, signing off.